So if you guys are ready and you want to participate with me in the Word of God and hold up your Bible up high, and if you want to repeat after me, repeat after me that this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, and my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same, never, 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 in Jesus' name, amen, and amen, and amen. If you will turn with me in your Bible, we're going to be in two places this morning. Romans chapter 8, verse 31, and then jump to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to jump to two places. God led the second scripture on my heart this morning. And, um, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And then Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. God's been good, hasn't he? When all God's people there, somebody say amen. amen. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Um, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And then Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I never really re read the New Living Bible, but I read it this morning, and I just love the way it kind of used these words to, to explain faith. So in verse 1 of the New Living Bible, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. Men of God in days of old were famous for their faith. Father, I ask and pray by faith that you would anoint my words, you would anoint this time, you would open up our ears and help us to see you for who you are and how good you are and how trustworthy you are and how worthy you are to be sought out and to be a part of our life each and every day in greater increasing measures. Help us, Lord Father to believe and to trust and to walk by that faith. In Jesus' name, amen. I started a short series last week called God is Good. Each week I get up here and I've been doing this for years. I say God is good and the church comes back and says all the time. And I say all the time and the church says God is good. We're not the only church to do it. It's a very common thing that is done with inside the body of Christ everywhere because we have decided and have discovered that, that God is good. But when we talk about his goodness, there's a lot of reasons why God is good. And I've just been led this last week or two, just as I've been preparing on the direction for the church, this desire to want to praise God. To want to spend some time on just bragging on his goodness and what does it mean for us. I don't know if we brag about God enough sometimes. We, we get caught up in so many other things that are good and necessary. And, and then we forget that we really need to brag on God. Uh, I, I believe one of my love languages is words of affirmation. You, you tell me how good I am and I'm a happy camper, right? My wife's love language is, is acts of service. I can tell her all day how much I love her and she don't feel loved until I do something for her. But understand, her love, language, her love language is not words of affirmation. So she's constantly running around doing stuff for me, showing me that she loves me. If you've ever heard of understood love languages, there are five. And all, all people have one, two, some of us have more. It's the way we express and it's the way we receive love, right? Since we were created in God's image, God has all five of those love languages. The way you express your love and receive love is the same way God does. But other than us just having maybe one or two, God has all of them. 
And God loves to be praised because one of his love languages is when his children stop for a moment to take a second to look at him and realize that he's good and say that he's good, but being able at the same time to point out why. Just saying God's good is good, right? But knowing specifically why. And the thing about bragging on God's goodness, this could go on forever. Right, because God is just immensely, infinitely good. But I do feel the need when we're talking about his goodness to define the terms because God's goodness can be described in different ways on two different sides. On one hand, when we talk about God's goodness, we're talking about his moral goodness, his, his purity, his lack of evil, his perfection. On the other hand, when we talk about God's goodness, we're talking about how he's worthy to be sought out, that he's worthy to be a part of our life. It, it's not about his morality or his purity. It's about what he's bringing to the table and that because he brings us to the table, he ma it makes him desirable. It makes him worthy to be sought out. It makes him worth being a part of your life in ever increasing measures. Uh, one of the examples I used last week are donuts. Janan and I were driving down the road this week and we were talking about Beverly's 15 layer cake. Yeah. Has anyone ever had a Beverly's 15 layer cake? Come on now, that cake is good, isn't it? That cake is desirable to be sought out. It's worthy to tell Beverly that my other knee is hurting because she made me one when I had surgery on this knee and then I was figuring maybe I can limp on the other one. I call that wait a minute cake. You know, wait a minute, cake, you're in a conversation and then you take a bite and you just got to wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Janan made some wait a minute cookies last night. She really did. She made like 200 of them because Stephanie said, I need a lot of cookies. She's got this big old thing of cookies and my I don't even have diabetes anymore, but it came back for a second when I looked at that. <laughs> cookies are good. The cake is good. The difference, though, is that you have to have Beverly's cake in moderation. I cannot eat that whole thing of cookies. I mean, physically I can, but it's not going to be good for me. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have to buy new clothes because I'm already pushing the envelope on some of the stuff I'm wearing now. Does anyone relate? You know, you get, so you, her cake is good, but not now. Wait, give me some time. I got to lose a little few more inches and I'll start limping on my left leg so I can get another cake from Beverly. And God is similar. There are things about God that make him good. And there's things about Jesus that make him so worthy to be sought out and so worthy to be a part of a life that you can just brag on him forever. Last week, I talked about how he's trustworthy. Now, the first reason and one of the reasons why I think God is worthy to be sought out is because you can trust him. You, you can count on him. He's reliable. He will do exactly what he says, when he says it, because he says it, because he is good and trustworthy. He's, he, he's dependable. And I want to go further with that this week. Because you can talk about God's trustworthiness all the time. Because we're living in a world where we need God to be trustworthy. Because we're living in a world full of pain, heartache, trouble, discomfort, sickness, disease, financial trouble, you, you can't tell me that life doesn't have its ups and downs. And there are situations that we get put in on a consistent basis that are completely outside of our control. And if it wasn't for God working behind the scenes, being dependable to keep the promises that he gave us when we came to him in Jesus Christ, we would be a mess. It was him keeping his promises to provide. It was him keeping his promises to protect. It was him keeping his promises to see you through that hard time because he's trustworthy and God has promised his children so many things. And we should grab on to these promises and we need to remember, remember these promises and we need to walk in these promises as if they already happened because God is good and God is trustworthy in Jesus Christ you can take it to the bank that God will do exactly what he said for you to you and through you inside of your life because God is good that's why I like the way Hebrews puts it. it well this New Living Bible puts the translation of when you talk about what is faith 
What is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. And when we walk by faith in Christ, we are confident that this is going to happen. Maybe not on my time. Maybe not exactly the way I want it to happen. But you all know it's going to be right on time and the, exactly the way we need it because God is good. I shared his trust, trustworthiness last week as if I shared this illustration of this tightrope walker who was at Niagara Falls and how he asked, they told everybody that he was going to walk across that tightrope blindfolded with a barrel and somebody in it. And they asked everybody if they believed he can do it. And they did. And they all shouted, yes, we believe it. But no one was willing to get in the barrel. What I shared last Sunday night that I really want, for those that weren't here, I want you to really get a grasp of. We are already in that barrel, people. If you have come to Jesus Christ appropriately, if Jesus really is your Lord and Savior, that is exactly what happened when you gave your life to Jesus. You looked at the chasm. You looked at your future. You looked at this life and you realized that it was full of dangers. It was full of perils. And you knew that if you did this completely on your own, you were going to fall off that tightrope and perish. And then Jesus showed up and said, I'll put you in my barrel and I'll take you across. And by faith, you said, yes, Jesus, forgive me, save me, carry me, take me through this life. Because I can't do it by myself. If that is what you've done, then you actually are a child of God in the barrel. You may not realize you're in the barrel because you're too busy looking down. And when you're high up, it's scary when you look down. And because you're looking down, you're forgetting who's behind you, who's pushing that barrel across the tightrope. We are in that barrel and life is scary, isn't it? I've had a good life. I really have. Compared to some, I've had a really good life. I've had trouble. I can sit here and talk to you about the scary times when I, I was terrified about what was going to happen. But he got me through. and He's got me through this part. God is good. The issue when it comes to our faith, faith is kind of like a double-sided, you know, like a two-sided coin. On one hand, when we demonstrate faith, we're believing that God can. And I think that's probably the easiest part of faith is understanding that this all powerful, all knowing, ever present God can help me. That there's not a situation, there's not something that I could be facing, not something coming my way that could ever come my way that he can't handle. I think that's easy to grasp. I, I think for most people, maybe not everybody, but I think most people that walk with Jesus for a little while, study the scripture, that understand that if God said, let there be light, and the next thing you know there was light, I think it's easy to understand that no matter what you face, God can help. The other side of faith, which is the little bit harder side of faith, is not just believing that God can, but coming to a place where you understand in your heart and you know that God will. See, can and will, two different things, isn't it? It's one thing to know I'm in this situation, and I know if I go to Marvin, Marvin can help me, but I don't know if he will. He might. There are a lot of things in life that we know people that can help us, but we're not too sure if they will. Let's take the building. We're thinking about moving and building a bigger church because we're getting full. We're running out of Sunday school space. We're running out of all kinds of things. And we kind of believe that God wants us to reach more people, that we have something here to offer that other people really could be a part of. But we don't have the money. And there's people out there that can write a check for that church. No, it would be no harder for them to write that check than to write a check for car service or bus fare to get from one place to the other. There are some people with money in this world that can do it without even thinking. But we don't know if they will. When it comes to God, take your faith past the knowing that God can and start moving and walking into, I know that God will because God is good and he's trustworthy and if he said it he will do it i think that's where romans comes in that's where this this little two verse line speaks so much to me it says what thou what shall we say to these things if god is for us who could be against us 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He's writing to the church who just gave their life to Jesus. They're born again. They got into the barrel. They're getting pushed across the tightrope, and it's starting to get scary because they're losing their jobs. They're being persecuted. They're not allowed in the temples anymore. And some of them are getting arrested, being fed to lions. Things aren't going good. And they're wondering, if God is for me, and he, I've given my life to him, why am I having so many troubles? Why is there so much pain? And he sits there and he writes to them, listen, if God is for you, nobody could be against you. He didn't spare his own son. He went as far as leaving heaven, becoming man, walking this earth to suffer and die so that you can have life. Why will he knock you out of the barrel now? Why will he just stop now? Why would you go so far? Have you ever been into something that you wanted to quit, but you were so far in, it didn't make any sense to stop now? You've already invested so much money. You've already invested so much time. And, and to give up now, you just lose so much. It's kind of the same way when we look at this verse that God is, He's invested so much already into your life and into my life and into the life of this world and the life of humanity for Him to tomorrow turn around and say, Sorry, Jason, I had enough. I can't help you with that. I, I, you Because know, we have limits, don't we? I mean, even with our children. I mean, there's a limit where it's like, sorry, you want your own now. I, I, you know, somewhere, well, it all depends on who you are. Some have a hard time cutting the umbilical cord. You know what I'm saying? But sooner or later, we give up. God never gives up. And he's sitting there and he's saying, I'll give you everything that you need. Maybe not everything that you want, because not everything that you want is actually good for you. I want all them cookies. But I can't have all them good. God is good because he's trustworthy. He can be depended upon. Now, here's the struggle. It was some years ago, and I would spend some time with my pastor, Pastor Casey Shore. And I think it was in a sermon one day, um, then some through conversations with him. He kind of shared that there were these four levels of faith. I don't see them as levels anymore, but that, that's what he called them. He called them levels. I, I see them more of as, as expressions. The ways in which we express our faith, or another way of saying it, ways in which we grow in our faith. Because if we all understand that we need to walk by faith and not by sight, how do I grow in my faith? How do I, how do I exercise my faith in, in greater and greater ways? He explained it in levels, and they might be levels. I, I don't know if they're levels. I see them more of expressions. And I felt challenged this week to share with you what he has shared with me. That there are these four levels or four expressions. You can call them what you want by the time I'm done and where it fits. But you will find yourself in all four or all five of these or struggling with one and doing really well in the other. But I do believe understanding faith like this is a very good practical thing for the body of Christ to understand so that we can walk by faith in greater ways. First one is what we call simple faith. Simple faith isn't simple because it's simple. It's not easy. Faith is always hard. Faith is always a, 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 something you're challenged to have to do. But we call it simple because it's easy to understand. It's not hard to figure out simple faith. Simple faith is believing that God will do something for you, can and will do something for you, because he's already done it before. Many of us understand that. Many of us have been through that. God has helped me here, so I don't fear anymore, because I know he'll help me there. Financially is the easiest way for many of us to understand that. I've had conversations with people in here that financially fear nothing. They have learned in walking with God that God has always provided for them. Things have gotten tight, but they've never been completely without. So when it comes to trusting God financially to care for you, to eat, and to have a house over your head, you have no problems with that because you've already experienced it. And you just say, no, I'm not worried financially. God has cared for me. I, I, and there's no reason for him to stop now. It's not only financially. It's just that's one of the ones that's the easiest to understand. He's helped me here. He'll help me there. 
I, I've learned that with Janan. She mentioned it the other day. When we first got married, we were financially strapped. And I think most people that first get married are tight financially. We were really tight financially. And she always did the bills. And she, 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 she was a whole lot better at that than I was. If you put the bills in my hand, we would probably would have been homeless. But, but you know, she did it. And she would stress. She, anyone ever stressed over paying bills and wondering how you're going to get by? That was Janan. And then she was sharing with me the yesterday as I was talking to her about simple faith. She says, I don't even worry about it anymore. God has, in, in the 31 years that we've been married, has taken care of us and our kids in so many ways that there's no doubt in her mind that he's good there. It's simple faith. There are many things that we see God helping us through in the past, so we're comfortable now in saying, God's got this. Simple faith. You, you see David and Goliath. That's a story to a, some degree of simple faith. Here's David. He, he's been promised by God. All of the Israelites have been promised by God that he was going to help them fight all their enemies. And now they're having a battle with the Philistines. And there's this big giant up there. And they are afraid to go against the giant. And little David comes, and little David says, I don't understand why you're afraid. God has promised that we, as his children, Israel, to protect us. And he's protected me before. I remember when he saved me when I was going up against the lion. I remember when I was going up against the bear. And if God helped me with the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine's got no shot. So he goes and he grabs his stones and he slays Goliath, demonstrating simple faith. It's not easy. His going up against Goliath was a stretch, right? But he understood, why would he let me down now? And the whole idea of simple faith is we need to start counting our blessings and stop forgetting everything that God has done for us. Oh, how soon we forget. That's my mother's phrase. You might have heard it before, but my mother used to say that all the time when I was a kid, when someone forgot or didn't trust her, she would say, how soon people forget what you do for them. And boy, do we forget the things that God has done for us. I know we forget because we're all sitting in this room and we didn't get here by ourselves. You demonstrated simple faith when you got out of your house and you got in your car and you drove here. You believed, one, that that car could get you here. Two, you believe that this card would get you here. If you didn't think it would get you here, you wouldn't have come. You trusted in that car. Because time and time and time again, every time you turned it on, it started. And every time you went somewhere, you got there. You didn't die. You didn't crash. If you thought for a moment that on your way here, you would have gotten into a car wreck and died, you'd be sitting in your house because you didn't have faith. You didn't believe that it could and it would. But since the car always has, you start it up. But I'm here to tell you, not everybody gets where their destination is. You hear it all the time. People dying in a car wreck. But we don't pay attention to that. We pay attention to what has happened before. And this is what we need to do with simple faith when it comes to God. What has God, has gotten, you, what has God gotten you through already? Make a list. Write them down. Count your blessings. Isn't there a song? Count your blessings one by one. You know, just remember them. Write them down. Put them on your windshield if you have to. Hang them from your rear view mirror. Put them in your pocket. Write them everywhere you go that my God shall supply all my needs because he already passed. What kind of faith do you need this morning? What has God done for you in the past? What can you praise him about this morning? What can you say, thank you, God? If you don't give me anything else from this day forward, you, you have already given me so, you've already came through so many more times. I'm going to stop worrying about it. And I'm going to just start trusting in your goodness because you are good. If God has helped you in the past, somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Everybody understands simple faith. Stretching faith? Is the next one. That's the one's a little bit different. That, that stretches you a little more. It takes you out of your comfort zone just a little bit. Because now you're not believing that God can do something for you that he's already done for you. You're believing that God can and will do something for you because you've seen and heard that he's done it for someone else. It wasn't done for you. Never experienced it. 
You just heard somebody testifying. You just heard somebody say, let me tell you how good Jesus is. Let me tell you how good Jesus is. Let me tell you what Jesus can do for you. Let me tell you about Jesus for a minute. And by listening to it, you realize, wait a minute, if he did it for them, just maybe, just maybe he'll, he'll do it for me. Isn't that how we all came to Jesus Christ in the first place? Everybody gets saved by stretching faith. Everybody hears somebody talk about Christ and you look at it, you hear it, and you decide for yourself, is that true? If he can save him, maybe he can save me. If he got in the barrel, I think maybe I should get in the barrel. I think that's why it's so important to testify. It's so important to always be prepared and ready to give an account for how awesome Jesus is in your life. Because what you're doing is you're strengthening your own faith. Because the more you brag about it, the more you'll remember everything that Jesus has done for you. And then the more you met and brag about it, just maybe someone sitting around is just waiting to step out and stretch their faith a little bit. And believe and trust it will do it for them too. Amen. Brag on Jesus everywhere you go. Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus the other thing. Jesus, Jesus found me a parking spot. It's just Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about believing that He's good and talking about it. Many, I would like to say, I'm on, I'm on a limb, I'm stretching, that people that have the least amount of faith have the least amount of faith because they don't pay attention to what He's done and they never talk about it, so they do not remember. So every little thing that happens, it's panic mode. It's time to go into just... Oh, but man, if you're talking about Jesus like all the time, like if he's constantly on, because he's doing something every day. If you don't have anything to say about what Jesus has done for you this week, make a change today. Start paying attention because he's doing something every day. Every day. And some superficial in your mind, he got you here, you didn't crash and die. I guarantee you, someone this morning did. Someone did. Someone did not make it to their destination this morning. And they believed they would. But he did it for you. Because he holds your life in his hands. And he's the one that gives you breath. And he's the one that can take it away. So we need to brag and we need to praise him. Not just because he loves it, but it helps your faith. It helps your faith. To, to, and when someone says, tell me something good God has done, it shouldn't take 20 minutes. Now hear me, sometimes we take a while. I, I understand why it's hard, because sometimes we're thinking of something big and grand, like, you know, he parted the Red Sea. No, it's as it's, it's simple as the day that I had yesterday with my wife was amazing. In driving down the road with her, we were talking, and, and I just thank God that at that moment he opened my eyes to realize that I need to be appreciative of every moment. Because we were talking about my kids, and we were talking about how when they were young, and we took them to Disney, and I cherished those moments, and we were talking about them. But at that time, I wasn't smart enough to cherish it then. I just wasn't. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I didn't realize, I mean, I should have cherished this because they're going to move out one day and, you know, and I'm not going to see them anymore. And, and so yesterday in the car, I, I, he opened my eyes and he said, cherish every moment, Robert. Now. That's a testimony. It doesn't have to be he parted the Red Sea. It, it, what did he do for you? Has he not opened your eyes? Have he gotten this far? Stretching face. Stretch it. Believing that God can do something for you because he's done it for somebody else. We see that in scripture with the leper. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 2, there was this man with leprosy. He comes to Jesus and he kneels before him and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Here's a guy, never been, never been healed before, miraculously. Doesn't know anything about it. But he's been hearing about this Jesus guy. He's been hearing how he's been going around and he's, he's been healing people, giving them sight to the blind and, and crippled people are walking. And they're hearing this awesome news about this Jesus who could heal. And he goes over to him and he says, I know you can. Are you willing? And we know the end of the story. He said, yeah, I'm willing. That's why I came. I came for that one reason, 
to be a part of your life, to put you in the barrel so I can get you across that big old chasm. That's why I came. Stretch your faith just a little bit. What about the centurion? He says, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Doesn't even understand. He just knows that you've been doing something for them. I can't imagine why you wouldn't do it for me. Testify. Yeah, especially when it comes to people coming. How are people ever going to come to Christ if you don't ever talk about what Jesus has done for you? Jesus saved me. That song, wasn't the song we were singing? He saved me, watched me, pushed my sins away, he lifted me up out of the ground. What has he done for you? Do you know? Have you been paying attention? I challenge you this morning. Pay attention. And don't just pay attention to what he's doing for you. Look around. Because there are people in this world that can sit there and tell you stories of how awesome and how faithful God is. Praise God. Praise God. Then there's... This one's, I guess, easier to understand. It's probably the easiest one, but the hardest, or one of the hard ones to pull off is miracle faith. You're believing that God's going to do something. It's a miracle. No, he's never done it for anybody before. You know, you, you just, I need a miracle here. Something has to happen. It's outside anything I can understand, but it, 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 sometimes the miracle is just, can you change my wife just to tan? No, you don't need that miracle. Shh. What about how, change my? I mean, miracle. Have you ever been married to someone who's just a mess? No. Ask my wife. She will tell you that woman needed a miracle a long time ago. I don't know what she was thinking when she said, "I do." I was broke. I had nothing. I I just thought I was that great. That's what it was. She, but I look back in the beginning years of our marriage. And this woman was waiting on a miracle, just hoping that this selfish, self-centered, lost, egotistical, all about me, could not ever put her first in anything needed to be changed. And God pulled off a miracle. Amen. We're talking about miracle faith, like, like parting the, that's parting the Red Sea faith. That's like putting blood on the doorpost, believing and knowing that when that death angel comes, it's just going to come right on by and it ain't coming in here because he said to put the blood on the doorpost. That's a miracle. Never experienced anything like that before. Water from rock faith. Manna from heaven faith. Rising from the dead faith. <laughs> I, I know I, every time I share rising from the dead, I can't help but share how I don't want to be buried. I can't. Don't bury me. Just remember that. If she forgets, you will hurt me. Do not bury me. I'm coming back. I don't want to be six feet under locked in a coffin when the trumpet sounds. Can God get me out? Yeah, he can. But I believe I'm coming back. Just put me over there in the bedroom. Just sit, sit, hook me up. Coming back. <laughs> Jesus was put in a tomb. And what, how did he come back? His body came back. There wasn't a dead body in a tomb and a new body for Jesus. Jesus came back. Amen. I'm trusting in that. Now, I'm not saying don't get buried. I'm not messing with everybody's head. But I was talking with her. I, I believe in miracle faith. I'm coming back. And if you cremate me, make sure you get every drop. <laughs> Last thing I want to do is come back. I'm missing my ear. Got half a leg because she left it in the thing. I got problems. <laughs> but I fit right in here, so hey. If I got problems, you got them also. Miracle faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faith. That even if he throws me in the fire, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> what kind of miracle are you in need of? I've shared this story before. A house that I owned. And um, I'll try to make it really short. But I owned a house and I got called into ministry, so I had to rent it. One thing led to know after one or two tenants, that house was falling apart. It was a mess. It was unlivable, it was uninhabitative, and it took more money than I had to fix it. 
and it was way too far for me to drive back and forth to fix it. So I didn't know what I was going to do. Janan was like, we need to sell it. And I said, Janan, you don't even know. I know you're a woman. You know nothing about selling houses. <laughs> True story. No one's going to buy that house. I'm going to have to find a way to fix it. I believed in a miracle. I believed God was going to give me money and going to find me the time, some way or another, to get that house livable. She was believing that it would be sold. A miracle. Two different miracles. Hers was wrong. Mine was right. It was grass needed to be mowed. It was like four feet high. I called the friend from the church that I used to attend down there who mowed lawns, and I asked him to go take a look and tell me what it would cost. So he goes down there to take a look. He calls me back, and he says, you know, it's going to take a lot to mow that. You need a bush hog. You can't do it with a mower. You know your front door was open and your windows were wide open? I said, I had no idea. He says, well, I hope you don't mind, but I went in and I looked around. Have you thought about selling that house? And two weeks later, that house was sold. That's miracle faith. That's Janan miracle faith. I, I asked for a lawn to be mowed. I'm looking for money. Give me a miracle. I'm going to come in with some money. I'm going to get this guy and the other guy going to do that. And, and she's like, could you sell the house for us, Lord Father? And that's what he did. Two weeks later, we were out of that house, done, gone, in the condition that exactly was. You all have miracles in your life, don't you? Even if it's a small one, make sure you pay attention because you're going to need that memory you're going to need that memory one day because you're still on the tightrope. You're still being, you're not across yet. It's not over yet. It'll start rocking one day. And it's going backwards that help us move forwards. Then he talked to me about transforming faith. This one's a little different. Transforming faith, probably, I don't want to say a better faith, some would say a better faith because you're not believing that God can do something for you anymore. You're past believing what he can do for you. You're at a place now where you're believing what he can do to you. You're beyond, you know, pay my bill, help me through this, help me through that. You're at a place where you're looking at scripture and you're looking at yourself and you're realizing that it's not matching up. You're realizing that you got so much sin, you got so much mess in you, you're, and you're just not looking anything like Jesus and you know you want to look like Jesus. So you get on your knees and you say, Jesus, 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 Holy Spirit, can you come into my life and change me? Can you do something to me? We call it transforming faith, sanctifying faith. When we move out of Christianity from him paying my bills to moving into a Christianity that says I need to be living a holy life. And I'm not. And it's only the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life that can change me and make me more like Jesus each and every day. That's a level of faith that many people don't have. Because they're comfortable with exactly what they're doing. They're comfortable in the condition that they're in. They've learned to live with it. And I'm here to tell you, don't. Don't ever learn to live with it. When you look at Jesus, come to that transforming faith and say, here I am, Jesus. Do something to me. Stop doing things for me. Do something to me. Change this heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Teach me to love. Teach me to care. Teach me to be selfless. Teach me to say no to temptation and yes to your Holy Spirit. Teach me to be listening to your Holy Spirit. I want to be like you. That's a level of faith or an expression of faith that many Christians never even dabble into. They spend their whole life just worried about the electric and worried about this and worried about that and doing all these things and all the God is just the candy man. You remember the candy man with Sandy Davis Jr.? The candy man can. He's, he's the candy man. He's gonna, yes, he is, but he's also the transforming man. He's the one that today is the day of Pentecost. We, this is Pentecost Sunday, the day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came to change you. He didn't come so you feel good and you just, ah, the Holy Spirit's here. <laughs> Fall out, wake up and out. No, he came to do something to you, to make you into who you were supposed to be before you were born. Amen. He came to make you holy. Without holiness, nobody's going to see him. It's just not going to happen. So it's that level of faith where we say, Jesus, can you change me? Could you help me be a better husband? 
Can I be the husband that Janan needs me to be? Can I be the wife that my husband needs to be? Can, can, actually, you could even just stop praying for somebody else. Could, could you change him? <laughs> can, you, can you change her? Can you change us? Can you change this church? Can you change everybody in this room? Do you believe that he could? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit, if you will surrender your heart and your mind to him and say, here I am, have me, do change it, show me, put me through whatever you need to put me through till I get to a point where I actually change. That's hard. That's not easy to do. I used to have a friend called, uh, <laughs> I can't believe I just, Bob, Bob Shutt. Bob Shutt used to always say it. You always used to always say to me, watch what you pray for. Because you just might get it. And he used to use patience as an example. He says, I've learned to never ask for patience anymore. He did, he was honest. I don't ask for patience anymore. He says, because every time I ask for patience, he puts me in a situation where I gotta act patiently. And I'm not a patient person, so I don't wanna. Because you don't just wake up patient one day. You get put in a situation, you're on that long line with that lady at the counter in Walmart that's got nowhere to go. And still writing checks. I'm sorry, because some of you might still write checks. Huh? <laughs> and she's just slow and just no tag on it. And then she's got a call for someone to go get the price check. And... Am I the only one in here that needs a little patience? But in order to demonstrate patience, if don't need to teach you patience, he'll put you in situations where you've got to demonstrate patience. If you need to learn how to love, he's going to put you in situations where you're going to have to learn how to love. But that's a level of faith or an expression of faith, transforming faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Open up your life to him and say, change me, Jesus. Change me. Today can be the day where the change begins, and I can become more like him. And then you have the last, but not least, I, I'm going to suggest that this, for me, is the greatest of all the expressions of faith. For me. Maybe not for you, but for me it is. And I'll tell you why. Because this is called serving faith. You are now moved to a level where you're not asking God to do something for you. You're not even asking God to do something to you. You're asking God to do something through you. That you've come to a place in your life where you realize that you're not your own. And then you've been put on here with a gift and a talent to use to build his kingdom. That there are people out there that need to know about Jesus. And you are just the one to help make that happen. And he's created you specifically for that. With a specific gift and a specific talent and a specific ability that he wants you to use to help the body of Christ reach this lost and dying world. It's the last level of faith because it's the least expressed level of faith. The harvest is plenty. But the work is a few. Getting to a point where we are not comfortable anymore. We're just coming to church. Hearing a message. Feeling good. Praising God. Going home. Going to work. Coming home. Eating dinner. Taking a shower. Going to sleep. Waking up. Going to work. Coming home. Eating dinner, showering up, going to sleep over and over and over again and never looking at yourself and say, God, here I am. How would you use me somehow, some way to help this world and your kingdom? I know you created me for it. I know you've given me gifts and talents for it and I'm not using any of them. Can you now use me? Use me. I'm ready to go to that next level. I'm ready to serve you. I, I know that's hard, and it's hard for a lot of different reasons. One, because it's hard to believe that God would ever use someone like you and I. That was the hardest thing in the world for me to ever realize that God wanted to really use me, and I was called to ministry. What a wrestling match that was. 
But somehow, some way, in his ultimate wisdom, this crazy kid from Brooklyn is now in Excel, Alabama, standing up here preaching to you guys, just hoping and praying that it's going somewhere. And if he did it for me, there's so many others in here that are serving God and like, why are you using me? And I don't know, but you are. So just keep using me. Keep using me. I want my life to have more meaning than what it has now. I want to be able to die and go into his presence and, and leave behind a legacy of people who've learned about simple faith, stretching faith, serving faith, transforming faith, who've came to Jesus to realize how awesome the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is. And I used my life for that. And I'm an integral part of why somebody is there. And I don't mean you're an evangelist because it takes a whole lot more than preaching in order to do that. It takes somebody to clean the carpet. It takes somebody to make sure that there's paper. It takes some, somebody's filling the bathrooms up with toilet paper. That's a gift. It's a gift to even realize it's empty and care. <laughs> Does that make sense? There's gifts of administration. There's gifts of compassion. There's gifts of organization. It's more than just being the teacher. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a role. And I call that serving faith. I call that, that that next level of faith. Some of you guys are just so friendly that a just big smile on your face and just would be amazing if you were standing by that back door when someone was coming through that, that scary dark hallway with a back door that looks like you're coming into, you don't know. Has anyone walked through that back door lately? If you walk through it a lot, you don't even notice it anymore. But if you walk through it your first time, you're not too sure what's on the other side of that door. But if someone was standing there with a big old smile, just letting people know, come on in here. You don't have to walk all the way around the building. I did that for a Christian son this morning. Is he in here? There he is. He thought I was crazy, too, because he was walking around. I said, you know, you don't have to do that anymore. He said, they told me I'm not allowed to go through that door. Really? He said, yeah, security. I said, ah, go through that door. You got my permission. I don't know if he was happy about it. I really couldn't tell. <laughs> Change is not easy, is it? We all have gifts. We all have talents. Every single one of you. If you've been born, he's given you talent. If you've been born again, he's saying, can I use you? I see that in Romans when Paul writes this in Romans chapter 15, verse 17. So Christ Jesus gave me, and this is the God's word translation. And the only re I always read the NIV, if anyone's wondering why I'm reading different ones. Last Wednesday in Bible study, I talked about scripture and the different translations and why they're there. And it just got me exploring. And I found some that just say things so well. And this one puts it this way. So Christ Jesus gives me the right to brag about what I'm doing for God. I'm bold enough to tell you only what Christ has done through me to bring people who are not Jewish to obedience, but what I, by what I have said and what I have done. By the power of the miracles and amazing signs and by the power of God's spirit, I have finished spreading the good news about Christ from Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? Paul was looking at his life and he was saying, I'm going to brag about what God has been doing through me. And I know that's hard because we don't want to be prideful, right? And we don't want to take credit for anything that God has done because the glory goes to him. But at the same time, some of you guys have put so much time into so many people. And there's churches, the condition that it is in, because of your willingness to use your time, your gifts, and your talents to step out on serving faith. And think about all of those in this room that have yet to do that, that are sitting in your chair right now saying, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Today is the day. Today is the day that I move out. I, I don't know what I can do. I don't know where I can do, but ooh, you talk to me or Stephanie or Beverly. If you like children, talk to Amanda, talk to Robin. You know what I'm saying? Talk, talk to somebody. You like men, talk about you. you <laughs> If you are a man and you like to fellowship with men, 
Talk to Jason. Talk to CC. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got problems. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I just like messed up the whole thing now. I'm just, I'm just glad I'm not the only one laughing. I tell you what. <laughs> There's always somewhere. There's always something. You like to fix things. You like, you got a hammer, screwdriver, like to use it. Talk to Marvin, talk to Mike and all. We got a lot of screws in here loose. <laughs> Father God, help me. Let me close. Let me close. <laughs> Where's your faith today? Are you walking by your faith? God is good. And he's worthy to be trusted. He's worthy for you to put your faith, your hope, your trust, and your allegiance completely in him and get inside that barrel and say, okay, Jesus, here we go. I'm ready. Are you ready for that this morning? Because Jesus is so worthy. And here's what I'm going to do. We're going to do Sovereign. Let's do Sovereign, that song Sovereign. I hope you guys like singing on the way out. I'm going to open up the altars for anyone that wants to come to pray. For whatever reason, you might have something in your life that you need Jesus to do. You might need to express simple faith, stretching faith. It doesn't matter. Miracle faith, serving, transforming. Now's the time. to Just come pray. Or to stand when the music starts and worship him right where you're at and give him the glory and the honor and the thanks for everything he's done for you so far. How's about that? Amen? If my, if my group will come. And I love to praise Jesus. So let's praise him together this morning. Father, just, Father you are awesome and amazing. And I... I thank you so much for all that you do. You've been so good to us in so many ways. And I just felt like bragging on you this morning. As we move forward in life, as we walk with you, let your spirit on this day of Pentecost, the day we celebrate the coming of your spirit, empower us and strengthen us to be everything you've called us to be. I love you, Lord. Amen. Somebody give God a round of applause this morning. For being good. God is good and all the time. Have a blessed week. Stay close to Jesus. Remember how good and awesome he is. I love you guys. Father, I thank you for everything you are and everything you do. Continue to go with us and glorify yourself inside of our life. We love you and praise you and thank you for everything ahead of time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.